Hello and welcome to Good Morning Vibrations, the format of the digital TV channel of the German-speaking issue FOPS. My name is Andrea Glesemann, I'm senior editor, and I'm happy to start the day with you. Under the theme, the morning makes the day, diversity makes the difference. In this format, I meet a lot of different personalities, talk with them about their career, what makes them successful, and what we can learn from them. So today, it's absolutely a pleasure to welcome Tara Shivani as my next guest. She is an expert in the fields of green infrastructure solutions and digital transformation. And she's been working over 10 years at international financial institutions such as the World Bank, United Nations and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. She's also an under 30 list maker. And today we will talk about how to tackle the infrastructure gap to fight the climate change and to what extent the current pandemic plays a role. So it's a pleasure to welcome you today, Tara. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Andrea. Nice to see you again. So um, let's begin with a morning habit question because there's a the common opinion that successful people have a certain morning routine. So do you have one? I think I started to really kind of found my own morning routine over the last year. Um, I realized I really enjoy learning um, uh, at least once a day in some shape or form. So I start my day usually by listening to the podcasts of the New York Times um, or the MIT Review. And I usually do that while multitasking. So either when I'm in the shower or getting ready, but it's kind of like an easy way of getting some additional input about other things that are happening that are aside from what's happening in the daily news. And then I think the other thing I really try to focus on every time is try to connect with my partner in the mornings. And I really use the morning hours to connect and talk about my plans and plans for the day and what are like intentions for the week. And in a way that helps me visualize my day much better. And I think now that I'm getting older and older, uh, I also started asking myself a bit more of a provocative question every morning, which is, you know, Tara, if today was the last day of your life, would you still want to do 80% of what you said you wanted to do today? And if I realize that there is an imbalance and it's more than that, then I really try to recalibrate to see if, if all of those things are really necessary to do in a day. Awesome. So when and why did you recognize that you want to work in the fields of um, the green infrastructure solutions and digital transformation? Well, I think I was always very interested about topics of climate change and sustainability. Um, ever since I started my studies in England at uh, Cambridge and Oxford University, where I was working on sustainable fuels, uh, in, in particular biofuels, um, I also realized that many of the issues that we're tackling at the moment in order to get us to a zero carbon world depend on the big uh, decarbonization challenges around infrastructure. And those are the ones who are really going to make a difference long term. So that was one idea where it was really important to me that drove me towards finding solutions towards that. But at the same time, I was born in Austria, um, but my parents are Iranian. And when you go to Iran, you realize that it's one of the most beautiful countries, but it's also one of the most polluted countries in particular the cities that you have there so tehran is one of the top five most polluted cities in the world and local air pollution leading to premature death is a very serious and imminent problem so i realized that you know we need to find a good match between solutions that are driven around technology but they're uh, possible to be driven towards uh, all countries, whether these are developing countries and developed countries. And those were kind of the challenges where I got really intrigued of. And I thought that, you know, it is good to have the um, academic background, but you have to go into the real world and you have to be part of an institution who has the financial backbone and also the mission to really drive change at the government national level. Your work has received international recognition in the form of um, several awards, such as the Aviva Women in Tech Award. So what do you think, what makes you successful? And so far, what's your biggest learning in your career? I think that, uh, I think success comes from uh, a lifelong hunger, so to speak. Um, I think I always was raised partly by my parents by thinking that, you know, 
there's uh, there's always more to learn and there's always more to understand. And every much you understand of the, the challenges that are happening today, the challenges are constantly evolving. And it's everyone's individual responsibility to evolve at the same pace that the challenges the world is facing are evolving. And so I think that um, the success that has come with, with, with kind of my achievements is more kind of like a side impact of kind of my passion that I've had to really try to find sustainable solutions that really make a difference. When you, for example, have the opportunity to go and work on the ground in Sub-Saharan Africa, when I was at the World Bank, uh, I had a lot of projects in Rwanda and, uh, and uh, Senegal, and you really can see that some of the projects that you're doing have real tangible impact on the ground for the people who are trying to get access to the basic needs you're not driven that much by the awards and the accolades. You're much more driven about how you can make a change on the ground. And if other people recognize that, that's just a great add-on to me. So when we um, when I have a look at uh, infrastructure solutions and the climate change, um, so where are the greatest uh, shortcomings and um, yeah challenges in that area? I think um, especially now is a really tricky time you know because because of covid really in the next 10 years we will de determine whether we stand any chance of preventing the worst impacts of climate change and those impacts are really a magnitude worse than what we've seen at covid 19. Um, actually if by 2030 if we have not cut our ghg emissions by half i mean there will be no way we will be able to avoid the most devastating uh, tipping points the economy is going to face. But the bill is very, very high. We're talking actually around $600 trillion of investments we have to put in there by the end of the century. And I think the really difficult challenge we're facing now is this pandemic-induced financial decisions every country is taking now over the next 12 months, right? So it's all around recovery packages, which cost trillions of dollars, and governments are all focused on jobs, 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 which is very, very important. But we will also limit the resources that have uh, that we maybe initially, before the pandemic, had dedicated towards climate needs and sustainability and reaching the Paris Agreements. Um, but I think the big problem is that we cannot really jump out of this frying pan of the pandemic into the fire ex exacerbated climate change because by then we will pretty much have run out of fire hydrants. And so we need to find a solution that is integrated to answering the crisis and the sustainability challenges that we have. And, and infrastructure is a very tricky area, which has a lot of potential, but is also, as you know, you know, you go every day to the, especially in the UK now, you try to go and use public transportation. No one is using public transportation. So there is a very direct impact and trying to find sustainable solutions is really at the heart of what we're trying to do. What different specific approaches could lead to significant improvements in, in that field? I think that overall, um, you know, I think long term, uh, governments really have to think about the choices they're making around these stimulus packages, because this is really going to create risks and opportunities, uh, especially when it comes uh, to climate change. But we don't have to start from scratch. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And um, because there is already many climate change adaptation plans and the national determined contribution plans of the Paris Agreement in place. So every government has already, who has signed up for the UNFCCC Paris Agreement, has already has the responsibility every year, every five years to come up with a plan of potential projects that would be towards a zero carbon economy. And we need to find a better way to assessing these projects to see whether they fit the needs of an economic stimulus. And so I think that there are three ways of reassessing these projects that already exist. One, of course, is around the short-term benefits of the stimulus and job creation. So could these sustainable um, reform packages around green investments increase the number of jobs? Or do they fit with local skills? Is there any necessity to um, ramp up the speed at which you're able to create these green new jobs? At the same time, um, if you are 
pushing for more infrastructure costs to push the economy towards to increase, is these jobs going to be just created during the construction phase? Um, or is these going to be long term sustainable um, jobs? And then, of course, long term, you have to think, are we really able to shift the trajectory of the CO2 emissions in a country by investing in these projects? And it is still a challenging road, but I think we've become more and more aware that really the next 10 years are the years we have to make a huge difference in the way we live and operate in order to tackle this challenge ahead. Yeah, and so you... Your work focuses on different regions, Africa and Middle East. And how do you find uh, the best solution for each region? I mean, the regions differ, right? Absolutely. I think um, I think uh, it very much differs because you uh, at the EBRD, we are not only focus on public sector clients, but also private sector clients, which are very different risk appetite and also very differently adopted in different regions. Um, and uh, especially now in light of COVID-19, we see a lot of companies, private sector companies, struggling with um, working capital requirements. So capital that is necessary to keep the overall maintenance of systems ongoing and being able to pay people and being able to keep the buses going, et cetera, et cetera. So what we at EBRD have set up is um, an emergency support program for infrastructure providers across all of the regions, which is looking at um, financing for public sector clients, working capital lines for municipals and utilities, and stabilization facilities for key infrastructure providers. Because the worst thing that, of course, could happen is no one wants to take public transport anymore, for example. And then we all go, um, which we already see, people are going more and more towards using their cars again. And by doing that, we are completely averting the initial plan of what we had towards more of a green recovery. Yes, yeah, so we're having a look at the current pandemic. And would you say the, the boost of digitalization, which is caused by the pandemic, uh, is also beneficial for the climate change challenge? I think so. I think it is indirectly most certainly very beneficial. Um, you know, uh, one has to think a bit more indirect of it because I think when you think of some things that are very obvious, I mean, one of it is like the, the, the use of cash in the economy, right? So I think this year is definitely uh, will be remembered as the crisis which finally ended our love affair with cash, basically. I mean, you see many shoppers are suspicious of handling cash, worried about anything, what if another person has touched it. And there was already a decline in the use of cash, but the coronavirus really kind of moved us towards a cashless society in something that would have had to take five to uh, 10 to 15 years to one year. And um, you can already see that in the UK, where before the coronavirus, um, the transactions that were, were, were based on cash were fewer than a fourth of all UK transactions. And now you're significantly down to that. So using less cash also has, of course, ripple effects on moving towards paperless trade and then onto the climate agenda more broadly towards reductions of CO2 emissions and other uh, and beneficial impacts. And I think you can see the same of by like how people are moving more and more towards remote working. Um, there are very strong pushes in some cities towards really shifting the architecture of a city towards having more non-motorized transport, bike lanes, um, public transport. And I think it is, um, I think it can be very beneficial um, but maybe not directly, more rather indirectly as part of the overall change we're seeing. So thanks, Tara, for your insight. It was absolutely interesting and yeah, insightful. And I hope you guys out there enjoyed the session as much as I did. And since we were talking about green solution, I would like to recommend another format at the Greatest Business Minds format. Um, Klaus Fiala, our editor-in-chief, met Miriam Staub, Bistang CEO at BlackRock in Switzerland. And BlackRock is the um, biggest asset manager in the world. And they talked about how to become a green investor. And I would also like to recommend you to subscribe this channel. So and for today, thanks again, Tara, for joining Thank me. Thank you so much. And for sharing your insights. And I wish you a really nice day. And yeah, hope to see you soon. 
Have a nice day. Bye.